Mark Golub. And in the news, the fall of a congressional icon, Democratic Congressman Elliot Engel, who served New York City for 16 terms and currently sits as the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, a committee of enormous significance to the U.S.-Israeli relationship. Elliot Engel lost in a Democratic primary election to an African-American progressive candidate, Jamal Bowman, a former educator and middle school principal from the Bronx. Representative Engel's defeat came as no surprise. He's been in the fight of his political life, and the portent of the outcome was a surprise victory two years ago of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who defeated the Democratic caucus chair and a 10-term incumbent, Joe Crowley. During Engel's 32 years in Congress, he was one of Israel's staunchest and most loyal supporters, though many in the Jewish community were disappointed that his fear of losing to Jamal Bowman made him far less outspoken in defense of Israel and against anti-Semitic statements of AOC, Ilhan Omar, and Rashida Tlaib. Well, what does Engel's defeat mean for the state of Israel and for the American Jewish community? And what, if anything, does his defeat say about the Democratic Party today? For some insight, we're joined by one of the most seasoned and successful political consultants in America, Hank Sheinkoff, president of Sheinkoff Communications, a strategic communications company that serves corporate, political, and public affair clients. Over 35 years, Hank Sheinkoff has worked on some 700 political campaigns, domestic and foreign, and his clients have included the likes of Bill Clinton, Michael Bloomberg, the former president of the Dominican Republic, Lionel Fernandez, and the former president of Mexico, Vincente Fox. And to top it off, Hank Sheinkoff received his smicha as a rabbi in 2011, from a yeshiva in Israel. And Hank Sheinkov joins us now from his home in the Hamptons. Hank, thanks so much for making time for the JBS community. Mark, I am very grateful to you for all that you do, and I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you. So before we talk about Elliot Engel's defeat, I want you to place yourself for our audience, Hank. How do you self-identify on the American political spectrum? I'm a, I'm a centrist Democrat. I always have been. I'm a Harry Truman Democrat. I believe in a strong national defense. Uh, I believe in collective bargaining, and I believe in the capacity of people to use the middle class as a way to get to the top. And that explains a lot of why where we are today, frankly, in the political problems we face as a community and as a nation. So you, as you describe yourself, Hank, it suggests that you would normally, not always perhaps, but normally vote democratic is that correct well if you live in new york city or in urban settings it's very difficult to have any power if you don't vote democrat because democrats have historically controlled politics in urban centers i live in new york city that's where i vote uh, and uh, if i were a republican i would have absolutely no power whatsoever but well, that's an interesting way of answering the question it because that's certainly not an ideological answer that's a sort of pragmatic answer. Sure. So are you suggesting if you, for some reason, you lived in a city which leaned Republican, you would say to yourself, for me to have any influence here, I would have to vote Republican? If you want to have influence, you have to be in a position where people will pay attention to what you have to say as a community. The problem in the Jewish community is that we somehow believe our, our, uh, we are wed to one side or the other, and that's not working out very well at all. The kind of candidates I mentioned that you've worked with, 
Clinton and Bloomberg. They're associated with the Democratic Party, although obviously Bloomberg has been all over the place. If right. I were to see your entire list of the political candidates you have represented, do they span both parties? They do. And um, I would add that uh, they are much, they tend to be much more centrist like Bill Clinton. I mean, that people are, they have short memories. Uh, anybody who likes to bang Bill Clinton around should remember that their portfolios grew exponentially when Clinton went into the White House. He was also a centrist. He also supported the death penalty. He also, when he was in, in governor of Arkansas, he passed the crime bill in 1990, what, during the, yeah, 94, which put 100,000 cops on the streets. I mean, he, he's the guy that created welfare reform. It's just otherwise just plain nonsense. But wait, all those things are so, one, I'm, I'm not for capital punishment, but many of the social things that Bill Clinton stood for and the fact that he was more of a centrist than a liberal progressive is very interesting. And Hank, many people forget who in the world he was. Yeah, well, look, we're in the present moment. We are because of a reaction to Clintonism. Uh, because both parties, frankly, have gone to extremes and because the Jews are very confused about where they belong. All right. You're going to help unf un unconfuse us. I'm First going to try. All, start at the beginning. Hank, why did Elliot Engel lose to Jamal Bowman? bunch of dynamics. So one of them is uh, Elliot Engel was running against Jamal Bowman, but there was a third candidate in the race, and that person was called been around too long. And been around too long tends to destroy incumbencies. 33 years is a long time in the interest of disclosure. I did a small amount of work for Elliot Engel when he first ran for Congress. He was there a long time. The we apportionment changed the district. When there were multiple candidates in the field, he had a much higher probability of winning. And when Jamal Bowman emerged as the only one, he was in deep trouble. Um, there is a leftward trend in the Democratic Party, and there is a rightward trend in the Republican Party. And both parties are in serious trouble. There is no middle anymore. And that's part of why we face such troubles long term in the United States. So, Hank, there are people writing in Jewish publications that Elliot Engel's loss, again, sort of to pick up what you're saying, is simply a, a part of the changing of the guard and that Jamal Bowman will also be a supporter of Israel in Congress and the Jewish establishment and the Republican National Committee has made far too much out of Engel's defeat. How do That's you see it? Nonsensical trite. Here's the facts of life. Look, we had Nita Lowy as a senior member of Congress and Elliot Engel as a senior member of Congress, both supporters of Israel, both gone. The facts are that this used to be the most religious country in the world. It is not the most religious country in the world anymore. It used to be a country of European derivative people. It is not that case anymore. The demographic shift is extraordinary. The population shift is extraordinary. We are becoming much more concentrated in certain parts of the country. Jews have always been caught in the middle. Uh, there's a great book by Ginsburg, uh, a political scientist at the University of Chicago. Um, you know, <laughs> look, we get caught in the middle. And the idea that somehow, if we look for protection from the great king, who people seem to believe is Donald Trump, that everything will work out fine is nonsense. The loss of Engel, the loss of Lowy, and the identification of Jews with Trump, while that population shift goes on, where you have people who are really having t tough times uh, making the rent and feeding themselves and finding health care and paying for the very basic things in life is a surefire recipe for disaster for us. Are you saying that part of the problem that the Jewish community is facing is that there are too many American Jews who support Trump? What I'm saying is that they are too identified with Trump and the emerging, emerging, you know, majority of the Democratic Party who are going to control Congress in the next, uh, certainly the House of Representatives in the next session, likely the Senate if these numbers keep going, although that's not an impossibility, but it's possible as well. You know, we, we've got to be able to play both sides against the middle without getting caught. The great Jewish dilemma has always been being squeezed in the middle. You look at the history of Jews in Europe much before Hitler, uh, and it's just, you know, the Inquisition, part of the Inquisition, I think, and ben Zion and Netanyahu, who's the great expert on that, was very clear. We got caught in the middle in the battle to make Andalusia and Aragon together, and that became a racial argument, which then took our money and had us murdered. I'm sorry, I need you to explain to me what it means for the Jews to be, quote, caught in the middle. 
in what we sense? are neither Republicans or Democrats. We loved Roosevelt so much. We sat there while Stephen Wise said, don't do anything, even after he was briefed by Jan Karski, that brave, great Polish patriot. And the end result was that six million of us went up a chimney and no one cared. We don't get it. We keep looking for the good king. There is no good king. We think that writing a check is sufficient. That's not sufficient. You've got to get your kids in the street, in those campaigns, in a bipartisan fashion. There is no good king. It's nonsense. We keep looking for safety and security in the arms of someone we think loves us. You know, it's nonsense. And to say that Donald Trump is the most significant supporter of Israel is nonsensical crap as well. Let me tell you why. The greatest and most supportive president of the United States in the new relationship, by the way, because it's a new country between the United States and Israel, which, frankly, the special relationship is, let's see, 1966. The guy is called Lyndon Johnson, who did more for Israel at a time when it was less popular to do so, before the religious right, than any president in history. Throw Kennedy in the mix, too. They were Democrats. Fascinating. All right. We may get to Trump more, but sure. tell, me, tell me now, um, what's it mean for U.S.-Israeli relations that we've lost Engel? You also mentioned um, Lowy. What's... Do you worry in any way for the impact on how America deals in foreign policy with the state of Israel? I'm not worried about the state of Israel. This is the American delusion that somehow people believe this is 1960 and the Israelis will die if we don't send them a check. And uh, they're really, we're much better than they are because we're here and they're there. No, the Israelis will function fine, thank you. They are the most, they are the most, they have probably, even more so than the United States, more moving, more quickly, more technologically than we are. They're very united. They're Jewish. We're disappearing. Our intermarriage rates on the West Coast exceed 80 percent and 70 and percent in the rest of the country. We don't have a unified community. Don't worry about Israel. We should worry about the United States. So the United States says, OK, we're not going to let our fleet that's not functioning today and has no courage to take on the Iranians in, this, in, the, in the Persian Gulf not do anything. What's going to change? Israel has a nuclear-powered navy, has the capacity to defend itself under all conditions, and will look to the east, which is where, it, you know, it's, it's just as this country cracks up, the Israelis are looking to the east, and the, and the market for technological capacity is increasing exponentially in the east. Guess what? They're not going to sit here and watch us and wait for us as American Jews to tell them what to do. It's a nonsensical, elitist viewpoint of who the Israelis are and what the Hebrew language is all about. Fascinating. By the way, every time you speak, there are four questions that come to my mind. It's a Talmudic way of thinking about it. It's not yes, the answer. The that, question is always Hank, the question. You're exactly right. So, Hank, is American Jewry cracking up? What is American Jewry? We are not certainly, we are, we are doing what everybody else is doing, except for the uh, most alienated portion of the United States, which frankly is the South never having gotten past the Civil War in many ways. I spent 30 years working in the Deep South on campaigns. I like the people. I didn't experience anti-Semitism in the South. I experienced anti-Semitism in the heavily Catholic Midwest. Southerners were always helpful to me, always happy to see me. Uh, the liberal idea that somehow there's something wrong with the Southerners uh, is not so. so. Their culture is different, and they like conservative people. Why? Because it's a way to ensure that they can keep the racial balance and control that they think is important. Wrong. It's wrong morally, but it tends to work out. That being said, what does it mean? The more we rely on the right, the more the right disappears, the lower the probability is that we will have the kind of importance we think we have. And if anybody thinks that no one will remember the attacks on um, the, the siding with Trump and the attacks on AOC and everybody else, well, they're going to remember. They're not going to forget. You know, you take a stand, you can't hide under a rock. you got to stand up. Are you critical of the Jewish community's attacks on AOC or Ilhan Omar or Rashida Tlaib? There is no unified attack on those people. You want to go get somebody, go put the money up, get your kids on the street, put them in campaigns and get them out. Organize. Don't think you can write a check. This is not, you cannot outsource your strength and you're protecting your future. You got to play in it. It's not sufficient to write the check. Ilhan Omar should have been defeated and the outcry should have been more significant. And the, the failure of, of so-called defense Jewish organizations proves, their, their, uh, their, their, proves the need for them not to exist anymore. What are they defending? Cocktails, dinners, and being important with pictures on the wall. But that's not what's going to change this picture. 10,000 Jews, Jewish kids in a district like Ilan Omar's 
working door to door is probably the better thing and supporting that effort. You know, people forget the great anti, the great anti-Israel, anti-Semite of the century. The last one around was probably in the Senate was probably a fellow named Percy who decided to vote against Israel. Jews quietly put up the money, put people on the ground and beat him. He was a senator from Illinois. That set the standard for what you ought to do. But uh, th what we're doing now isn't working and no one's afraid of us. People are afraid of the Israelis. They laugh at American Jews. Mm -hmm. But they're not afraid of the Jews? Were they once afraid of the Jews? They're once afraid of the capacity of Jews to get things done, i.e. Chuck Percy's the classic example. We don't do that anymore. Why we not? Don't, we, what, what, boy, that's fat. Why don't we, Hank? What, what's been lost? Is it, is it a, a matter of philosophy? Is it a matter of nerve? Is it a matter of leadership? What's been lost? Look, so you also know that I have a PhD and I'm a, I'm a social scientist. So I look at this all very differently. We are, we are not thinking clearly about our position. We have deluded ourselves into believing that somehow we are part of the larger structure and that somehow it's uh, the, the three, this nonsense of the three great religions, the Judeo-Christian ethnic here and there. I don't know what they're talking about. We will always be outsiders so long as we, so long as we don't do what everybody else does. They're on Sunday. I'm on Saturday. Okay, different question. Our entire culture is different. We tried to to uh, Christian Christianize Jewish practice, and the end result is that we're no, we're in two places at the same time and nowhere at all. No one's afraid of us. Our money doesn't matter in the way we think it does. Therefore, we need to do something else. And there are parallel examples. When states around the country wanted to enact tort reform, they passed legislation that made the trial lawyers' money less valuable, so they couldn't put up money for campaigns. Therefore, who cared? You know, if you have a Democratic Party, for example, that is in major majority, and you've sided with the other guys, what do you think is going to happen the next time you need to go see somebody? Yeah, what? Are you going to get in the door? Okay. Mm -hmm. You're not. And the people in the Democrat Party who are going to control that, that entity, they don't owe us anything. You know, the, it's um, kind of when I was a kid, even my grandmother used to say to me, no, grandmothers in the neighborhood used to say, Zondreivelt and Develt, Yendevelt and Roosevelt. You know, it's so not true. That's number one. He was not uh, the great protector of the people, and we've gotten past that. So we cannot find our bearings. We're now seen as the elites, and there are people who are, want the country who, frankly, have a real beef. They did get screwed. Simple. They have a right to have some representation. We're now seen as the blockers of their representation as well. There has to be a way to get this worked out in some fashion. At one point, it was all about Jewish money. That's the way the Jewish community thought as it was working with politicians of both parties. If it's not money, then what influence does the Jewish community have on American politics in any way? Well, well here's the point. We are small in number. We are concentrated in urban centers generally, which are moving to the left overall which are becoming where the, where the reapportionment will be the worst thing that probably happens to us in cities on the east where we've had strength because we've had a move out of people. The census may reveal something very different. Next year, the congressional districts will be redrawn. New York is likely to go down one of the seats, potentially one of those that was won by uh, one of the progressives, and maybe not. The public clamor for a reapportionment that reflects the changing demographics will be very significant. So we're fewer number, we're fewer, we're less identified. Um, we are disappearing as a, as a collective group. And the only ones that, are, that seem not to be disappearing based upon the Pew study findings and, uh, you know, pretty generalizable to the present moment are observant or more orthodox people who have very little in common with the rest of the population that's disappearing and who, and who see themselves as more conservative and they politically define themselves as conservative so they can be conservative as well in their voting patterns, which is not going to help. Not going to help. That, the did money not, comes that, from didn't, the, that didn't answer my question. Where does Jewish strength or power, political power, come from if it's not money? Or are you suggesting? Problem, are you suggesting, Hank, in in some subtle way, it's over for American Jewry when it comes to politics? It is over as we think it was. Maybe it never was what we think it, what we thought it was. But our power in Washington without the likes of Engel and Lowy is going to is going to be reduced significantly. And the battles are going to be much more significant. 
and we're going to have to do something very different, which is we're going to have to write a check and go to work. We can't outsource our, our freedom. We can't do it. Are you suggesting in some way that the Jewish community has sort of gotten lazy and isn't working at American politics? And I assume, by the way, if you say that, you're also referring to the major figures in political leadership, Jewish communal leadership at the present time. Am I correct? Could you use some youthful energy that was entirely based on being a Jew? Yes. Could you use some youthful energy that was based less upon social issues about what you think everybody wants you to think and how you fit in? The answer is yes. Could you use Jews who stood up as Jews? Yeah, I'm not asking people to find Mordechai Nalevich. We're not in the Warsaw Ghetto, and we don't need a guy who's got his courage and conviction and morality. What we need is people who put the Jewish community first, say, look, Israel is our heart and soul. There's no dancing around it. And by the way, we'd like to agree with you on this, but if we don't, we don't. And then put the money behind troops in the street, getting our kids educated how to do politics, and letting them do less shopping in the Hamptons on the weekends in the summer, and more organizing communities throughout the country. All right, I want you to let me sort of frame a question. Sure. And it, it, everybody understands, the Jewish community has tended to vote somewhere in the 70% range for mm -hmm. the Democratic nominee for president. And 70% of American Jewry roughly identifies as Democrat, uh, supporters of the Democratic Party. Sure. There are people in the Jewish community who would point to two events. I want to mention both of them to you, and then I want you to just react and explain to me how it fits into the total picture. As Barack Obama was leaving office, he permitted a vote in the Security Council against the State of Israel, it had to do with settlements, but it was a dramatic departure from recent U.S. foreign policy. And many Israelis and many American Jews who support Israel felt that it was a knife in the back of Israel as Obama left, you know, was going out the door. At the same time, we've heard recently that Joe Biden, who is the presumptive nominee for the Democratic Party in the upcoming presidential election, has said that if he is elected, he will restore payments to the Palestinians to the Palestinian Authority, which would be used in part for pay for slay, which had been stopped by uh, President Trump. There are people who therefore say that there's a shift in the philosophy of the Democratic Party that reflects it is less committed to a viable Israel, or at it, it is less committed to being an ally of Israel, then is the Republican Party. I want, I, would argue, I, want, I want your assessment of that concern. I would, I would argue the following, that the United States is more concerned about being involved in a land war in, uh, in the Middle East, which it, in two times things have not worked out so well. Number one, actually, yeah, well, one time worked out well, but two other times didn't work out so well at all. Sec thirdly, I would argue that the, that, uh, I just finished a book in, by uh, Yudit Achonot Press, on the um, on the question of Iran, and uh, over the timetable, and I have to I have to ask everybody to take a pause for a second and say, wait a second, what can you imagine if Barack Obama went around the Rosh Hashanah, the Prime Minister of Israel, spoke before the Knesset and effectively damned the government of Israel, and expected everybody to applaud him? Because that's what Bibi Netanyahu did in the United States. What do people think? So I don't understand. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't understand the connection of that comment there is, there is to my connection. question at all. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to explain it real clearly. So if you are behind the scenes attacking the president of the United States because you want to bomb Iran, which is what happened. It just, it's, I just finished the book. And that's what you want to do. And you're expecting the Americans to back you up. And they don't do it. And you, like a petulant child, do what no other head of state has ever done in American history which is to go to both House of Congress and attack the President of the United States. What do you think is going to happen? I don't, Bowie, it sounds to me like you feel that Obama's handling of the Security Council was A, tit for tat, and B, acceptable. Hank, are you, acceptable. Saying to, are you it's, saying to me 
that what acceptable. Obama did should not bother Jews? Whether, but, I'm, but whether but I'm saying, D.B. did something outrageous, and I'm not saying he did, even if he did, you know, for all of the criticism of Trump, he's petty and he wants to be vindictive. And then what you're saying to me is, listen, after B.B. did to, to Obama what he did to him by coming to speak to the Joint, House of Con joint uh, Session of Congress, of course Obama's going to stick a knife into the back of Israel. Hank, that makes no sense to me. That makes no sense to you, but let me give it to you a different way, okay? Again, Obama's great mistake was that he was a pretty good domestic president and a lousy foreign affairs president. Bibi Netanyahu was no help, and he did what he was supposed to do for his own country, right? He said, let's go bomb Iran. The United States did not want to participate, nor would they back him up. Those discussions went on. I just finished the book about it. I mean, it's pretty clear. Do I think that you should go to another country, to its, to its representative uh, body, and attack the president of the United States? No, I don't. Not a smart move. By the same token, should you give the Russians more solace so they can control the Security Council and who knows what their plans are, which is what happened? Guess what? This guy in the White House is doing that right now. You think it's going to last? By the way, I am, I am really fascinated and confused. Don't be by, confused. No, let me finish. By the conflation of evils or sins. And, I, you know, what Trump does now it doesn't answer the two questions that I, I posed to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer you a different, I'm going to answer you the same way. You can't go, this is not, United Israel is not the 51st state. You cannot go to the House of Representatives and the Senate as a joint council, as a joint entity, and attack the President of the United States and expect them then to say, have a nice day. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. I'm not taking Obama's side. I'm telling you that in politics and international politics, there is no greater morality. There is only power. And what, the, what Bibi did was to challenge that president's power. You don't do that. It wasn't good. It doesn't work out. And the president rightly responded as the most powerful man in the world and say, take that. So in Whether some way, it's right or in not, some way, morally, it, it's a different question. It, in some way, you, you're giving Obama a pass on this? Oh, I'm not giving Obama a pass. What I'm saying is it was all dumb on both sides. It wasn't the way to handle anything. Okay, fine. It's all dumb. That doesn't answer my question. My question is, understand how American Jews look at two events from two different presidents. Whether, and mm -hmm. this, has no, this does not have to do with anything with Trump. On the one hand, for I'm whatever... I'm not a Trumper and I'm not an Obama. Let, let me finish. For whatever reason, you're saying it was tit for tat, which, by the way, again, the way in which... Obama is normally spoken about. Normally, we wouldn't have associated the tit for tat mentality with Barack Obama. We only consider that to be a feature of Donald Trump. It's interesting that what you're saying is, you know what, if you stick a thumb in somebody's eye, expect them to stick a knife into your back. Fine. But the Jewish community looks at what Barack Obama did. By the way, Barack Obama came into office by having the Muslim Brotherhood in the front row of his address in Cairo. And he yep. leaves office by sticking a knife in Israel's back at the UN. For whatever yep. reason, that's the bottom line. May and, I? Thank and, you. and now we have a presidential, a possible a presidential nominee saying that he will restore payments to the Palestinian Authority, which they can use for pay for slay. Hold on. You understand first, why gonna, that bothers some Jews, do you not? I'm not saying it doesn't. What I'm saying is, I'm, look, I don't think you paid a price or any of these wise guy Jews that attacks me paid the price I did. I got fired at CNN. It cost me a lot of money when I attacked Barack Obama, and I did it on a constant basis. What I'm telling you is how politics work, not what my own feelings are. As to pay for slay, it's an outrage. But I think a fellow named Sander Gerber would tell you that the Taylor Force Act gets rid of that. So we can't do it. We have to calm down and look at reality. Our position is lousy. We just lost, took two big losses. We have a guy in the White House who may not be there that some people perceive as our friend. And we have somebody coming in the White House, possibly, who we, we may perceive as being on both sides of the question because we rightfully don't like Barack Obama. But that doesn't change it. I'm giving you an analysis. I'm not giving you my personal feelings, and I've certainly paid a price for what I say. 
It has not helped my business to take on the new Israel fund. I did it. I didn't see a lot of other Jews standing up to say a word. It cost me a lot of money when I got fired at CNN because I stood against Barack Obama. So all the big shots with the big mouths haven't paid the price. I did. Commitment is one thing else. I'm giving you the analysis. You cannot attack the most powerful man in the world and expect not to have a reaction. All right. Was it right? Wrong. Okay. Did Barack Obama know what he was doing in Cahir? No. It was stupid. And he set the standard for the next eight years of his presidency. So don't tell me your view. Just tell me what you think it's going to do for American Jewry. At the moment, do you worry for the Democratic Party's attitude towards Israel? If we're losing Engel and we're yep. losing Lowy, which you now identified as two major yep. spokespersons for the Jewish community, especially as it applies to Israel, and your point is we've lost both of them, yep, what's, yeah. it, what's it mean for the relationship between American Jewry and the Democratic Party? There is no relationship between American Jewry as we define as Jews and the Democratic Party. It's a uh, romantic idea. And there is a temporary relationship between the Republican Party and Jews. Why? The Jews that are with the Republic, the Democrats are generally disappearing at a very fast rate of assimilation into marriage. The ones that are saying that think the Republicans are not disappearing. They've, they've identified, as I said before, conservative thinking with halakha thinking. You know what? It's not good news for the long term because there ain't much we agree about. We are, we are just like the two political parties at extremes of the spectrum. And uh, what the future holds is very, very frightening to me for my children. So develop that idea for one moment. What part frightens you the most for your children? Well, I, I can see, I predicted social unrest in my, in my classes and in my discussions with people. Um, I predicted the income inequality um, increase, as did many other respected social scientists. Uh, it's going to get worse. Um, when you have those kinds of settings historically, particularly income inequality and those kinds of, of uh, gaps, you tend to have increased anti-Semitism. In Europe, before the war, it resulted in expo ex exclusion of Jews from universities or in separate schooling settings in Romania, Hungary, and Poland. So this is not new information. History will repeat itself. The question is how much time do we have left here? Because we have no place to go. We have no place to go? Within the political spectrum? Absolutely not. We're stuck. And if the shifts of power continue, where the population continues to shift to be less Europeanized and religion becomes less significant in the lives of Americans, which I've talked about a lot, then our position becomes even further eroded. All right. I want, again, I want to ask it as directly as I can. Sure. Are you worried that the Democratic Party, which at the moment seems to be moving to, towards being progressive, rather than liberal, is it in some way a threat to American Jewry at this point in history? I don't believe there is a Democrat or Republican Party. I think there is a takeover attempt, and I think that it will largely be successful on the, in the Democrat side, and it presents a significant problem for us and for Israel in the next Congress. All right, talk to me for one moment about Donald Trump. The people who say he is Israel's best friend, and by the way, Hank, there are those in Israel who are saying it. You know, it's not just about you know, a subway train being named after him or a, hmm? a, a, a community up in the Golan Heights being named after him. Many people believe that substantively he has done many things sure. that they wish other American presidents had done, including moving the embassy and in some way recognizing the Golan Heights as part of Israel. And making statements and even pre presenting a, a, a peace plan, which one can either criticize or not criticize, think it's good or it's bad, but it, there was a peace plan that begins with $500 billion of economic aid for the Palestinians and saying to them, ultimately, you must accept one notion, one reality. The state of Israel is here to stay. And whatever we work out for the Middle East, you Palestinians have to begin with that premise. For many American Jews who are committed to Israel, and for many American Jews, you know, Hank, it's their number one issue. That makes Donald Trump look pretty good as a president who cares about Israel. Why do you, why do you sort of 
sort of scoff at that. I'm not scoffing at that at all. I think that that's real. That's not what I said. What I said, the best friend we've ever had, and I'm tired of hearing people tell me that, is Donald Trump when the best friend we ever had was Lyndon Johnson. I understand Despite that completely. American, that's, no, that's that, that I understand. That's what I said. Okay. As to what this so president that, has done is, with this, hold on. I want to answer the question as to what this president has done for Israel. It's wonderful. You know what? I don't need him to tell me as a Jew that the Golan Heights belongs to the Jewish people. You know why? Because it does anyway, number one. And number two, Sykes-Picot made that happen a long time ago. It's in the original Sykes-Picot agreement. There's no discussion here, which is By not violated way, with international here, law. Here you and I disagree fundamentally. And I haven't, it's been interesting for me to hear everything you're saying, and I wouldn't use the word disagree, but it has to do with what the world is willing to view and accept and, and conceptualize. And Sykes-Picot had nothing to do with the way the Western world, and for that matter, America, views what's going on inside the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And it, it, just, and it doesn't matter what Israel thinks in terms of what if influencing how Germany thinks and how France thinks, how the UK thinks, how the Democratic Party thinks, how most American Jews, how liberal American Jews think. It does matter if in some way the, the embassy is picked up and moved to Jerusalem, even though you and I always understood Jerusalem was the political capital of Israel. Anybody with a brain understood that. But it was symbolically important for the United States of America to make certain statements. One is, from now on, the world should recognize Jerusalem as the political capital of Israel. And the world should understand that. It's not about but Sykes-Picot. By the way, 99% of my audience right now doesn't even know what sykes P the reference to Sykes-Picot is. Most of the world does not know what Sykes-Picot is. It matters what the President of the United States and what the United States does, whether it's under Lyndon Johnson or under Kennedy or under Truman or under, under Donald you're, Trump. We're not, we're, you're, you're, you're saying something that I'm not saying. I'm telling you what the international law basis is for an argument, which people keep talking about. Violations of international law. There is no violation of international law. Trump has been terrific on certain things. I'm not criticizing him. What I'm telling you is there's a larger problem in this country. One thing has nothing to do with the other. I'm not conflating Obama, and okay. I'm not defending what's, Obama, nor am I. I'm trying to get from you, what's the larger problem? Larger problem is we're not going to have, well, there's a good possibility right now, if, if the polling data as of this day, June, June uh, in the end of June of 2020 is correct, it's likely that this president will not be in office. It is likely that the House will remain under control of the Democrats, and it is likely that the Senate will remain in Republican control. And what's it, what's it mean for American Jews, and what's it mean for the U.S.-Israeli relationship? The U.S.-Israeli relationship will continue to deteriorate, and that's the impact of the, uh, in, in subtle ways, and that's the impact of the Engel defeat, because we won't have the people in Congress, and Lowy's, Lowy's, Lowy's uh, desire, decision to retire, we won't have the people in Congress we've counted on to, take, is, to, take, to protect Israel's interests. Simple. How frightening is that for you? For me, it's very frightening. That's what I'm telling you. I'm, and I'm less worried about the Israelis than I am about American Jews. I'm deeply concerned because our relationship to Trump is going to be used against us. That's what I was saying before, whether right or wrong by the new people in power. Because this idea that somehow we're oppressing some group of people someplace is going to become the norm. Because we're not uniformly engaged in telling people that promoting textbooks, for example, that talk about murdering Jews is not an appropriate way. It's a form of child abuse and that our voices can't be heard for some reason. I am concerned that you, it is quite okay, not for the world to say nothing about Boko Haram killing hundreds of people at a clip, maiming and raping women, and that for what we do when we live in our own country, Israel, that somehow that very existence is threatening to the rest of the world. And Trump has provided us with a balanced argument against those kinds of reactions. The problem is he may not be there. How do we live through a Joe Biden presidency? And how do we protect ourselves from the left? Getting into the street, running campaigns, putting our money into direct activities, and running candidates, frankly, who are Democrats against those Democrats in primaries and trying to win based upon issues that are less related to Israel and more related to the economic conditions that people are facing. That is the great problem. Mm -hmm. Well, that's beautifully said. 
are there any Jewish organizations you see, whether it's APEC or AJC or ADL or the President's Conference or whatever, is there any organization on the American scene today which understands the strategy and the importance of the movement that you've just described? I don't know. And I, I think that Jewish organizations, as is the case with our Congress and as is the case with other organizations and other communal activities and other groupings, are going through the same generational shift. The challenge that American Jewish leaders will face in the next decade is an overwhelming one. It's like nothing they've ever experienced anymore. The Shoah is over. You know, we have a religion in this country based upon dead Jews. It would be far better if our leadership began to think about the live ones. You know, when you get off the plane, you send these missions to Israel. How about instead of worrying about Yad Vashem, take people to Highway 6? Show them what the greatest people in the history of the world have done for the rest of the world in science, in protecting human life, and in extending human life. That would make me as a Jew feel a whole bunch better. By the way, Hank, how do you read what's going on in the streets of America after the murder of George Floyd by a Minneapolis policeman? What's there were three things. Well, there were three things going on. I'm a former policeman. When I saw that, uh, when I saw that uh, that cop with his with his knee and that man's neck, I cried, and my wife can tell you that. Um, it was it, it was overwhelming that the law could be abused in that fashion. I was just overwhelmed. By this, by the other side of it, are protests legitimate? The answer is yes. Is rioting permissible? Permissible? The answer is no. Should that have been controlled? The answer is yes. Is this ultimately about income inequality and disparities? You bet. You bet. Has the Jewish community been unfairly targeted in Los Angeles particularly? The answer is yes. What do we do about it? We better fix the tax law. I mean, I just wrote an op-ed piece about this for somebody. If we don't fix the tax law, if we don't really take real steps, and I'm not talking about liberal giveaway programs. I'm talking about provide jobs in the new tech sector, make sure that we educate people in the inner cities to fit those jobs, and stop, and stop using redlining, which we do through federal programs and others, to ensure that we can't create intergenerational wealth in minority communities, this is going to happen again. What Joe Biden's election will do and what these demonstrations do is they take the steam out of the political system. At some point, this won't work. Those demonstrations take steam out, they reduce pressure inside. Joe Biden's election will reduce pressure among those same groupies. Well, we need longer term solutions or we're gonna have more of these events. Is America racist, Hank? No, I don't believe America is racist. I think Americans, America, I just finished a book about this actually by a, by a, by a fellow at the University of Texas. Um, and he makes a good kettle and he makes a very important point. The country was founded to protect, the country was founded with good intentions and in order to create the founding race had to become part of the issue and protect of slavery as an economic system. Wrong morally and in every other way. As Jews, we certainly understand that, okay? Certainly understand that. Is it racist? Racism has become a part of our lives because we continue to see blacks in a particular way. And yes, progress has been made. But since 1980, since Ronald Reagan, with the tax system that was, was really remanufactured to benefit the top, with the, with the destruction of collective bargaining and unionization as a way to redistribute funds in a real way, not just giveaway programs, and the decline of the so-called deindustrialization, which was really about making more money for more corporations by taking apart companies. This has gotten worse and it's escalated. Is it racist? No, but it certainly does benefit the people all the way at the top. And those below the top know that because they're not getting the same benefits as the guys all the way on the top. It's not a good system economically. It can't work that way. And the competition between states in that economic crisis is going to get worse and put Jews in a more difficult position, not less. How do you feel about capitalism these days? I love capitalism. I think it's a wonderful thing. I just think we need to humanize it every once in a while. You know, the battle in this country, going back to Andrew Jackson, was really between corporations and maybe probably earlier, corporations, banks, and the people. Nothing's changed. It's why Teddy Roosevelt, the Republican, believed in antitrust activity. It's why we have laws against monopolies. <clears throat> but what's happened in recent times is those, those attempts to undermine that system of protecting people from corporate avarice which is a real deal and you know, that's part of capitalism, have been modified and mollified. You can't do it. You don't, if, you, if you think it works, go out in the street and see what people are doing. It doesn't work. We can't expect people not to be upset about it. Is, do you think that's what's driving the protests that are, we've seen in the streets across America? 
do they un- I, I do think, they do they understand the problem as you just defined it? They may not, but the young people, young white people, are in there because they got the joke. You know because, what the joke I'm sorry, is? Because why? Young people are out there, young white people are in the streets because they got the joke. Let me tell you what the joke is. The joke is that if you go to college and your parents spend the money and you borrow the money, you're going to, everything's going to be hunky-dory. But they figured out that they can't do it and their parents' wealth is being sapped and they've got student loans because their parents are paying for apartments in cities that they can't afford for jobs that may or may not have the payoff they think. And the only way you can get the payoff is if you go and exploit other people in financial means, rightly or wrongly in true capitalism. And the money just keeps concentrating the upper portion of the, of, the, of, the, of the pyramid. Well, I don't hear anybody saying anything near what you've just said in the streets. That's, no, not, you look that's, at the white not, kids that's not the perspective of they're what's angry. driving this. They're, they're angry, you bet. I would be they're angry, angry for blacks. They're angry for blacks, but the white kids, I'm, I, you know, I'm talking to them. I talked to my son's generation there in their 20s. They, they feel they got a raw deal. The student loan debt, the cost of housing, the fact that parents have to subsidize it, all of it is not pleasant. They don't think they're going anyplace. They don't think there's any future. How do you feel about this destruction of the statues of Washington and Jefferson and Jackson and mm-hmm. Teddy Roosevelt? Outrageous behavior. Outrageous behavior. Whether there is a reason to want those statues dispatched from where they are is one thing. But we have called we have a process. It's called law, discussion, meeting in public, and making decisions. When people act on their own in this way, all they do is they spur the probability that we will have greater acts of violation of law that will create disorder. And it reminds me very unfortunately of um, of fascist behavior, particularly in Europe before the war. What's your, th- what's your feeling about Black Lives Matter? And when you hear people like Dershowitz say that Black Lives Matter has inherently in it and in its platform anti-Israel and perhaps anti-Semitic language, do you think he's right or wrong? Um, let's see. Do I think he's right or wrong? I think that there are elements of the Black Lives Matter community that feel that have those strong feelings. I think that those many of those people have been identified. There is no question about it, um, and I do think we're caught again in the vice because we're on all. We are as a, as a community are not unified. We're not one voice, and we're on all sides of the question. I think that it's outrageous that the intersectionality argument has become the way we define how Jews should feel and who they are. When somehow, if you're not pro-Palestinian, whatever that is, and you're not pro uh, pro violence in the streets, and you're not this, then therefore you must be um, a Zionist, and that is a dirty word. So, so I think Dershowitz is on to something. Do you worry that the, the, the rioting, not only simply the protests, but the rioting that we see and the destruction we see, and, you know, the breaking of glass, and I'm not suggesting this is the American Kristallnacht, but right. there's something ironic about all this glass being broken in this, in the violence that we've seen during these, in the past month, practically. Do you ever worry that it could turn against the Jews? I worry all the time that this can turn against the Jews. Absolutely all the time. And I don't think the way to deal with it is to somehow say, well, here's 100 grand, go do what you want to somebody, or here's 10 grand, here's a government grant. I don't think that's the answer. I think giving people pride in their lives and ensuring we have an economic system that gives them that opportunity is different. We don't have that today. We have something else. We don't have basic economic reforms in some fashion that are significant. We're going to have these riots again. We will have continued civil disturbance. I've said it in my classes. I've said it in public and speeches. I've written about it. I mean, you cannot have this continue. Why? Bad news is that is that we think it's all wonderful, but the internet happened. You know why? Because now somebody who lives in a housing project and can't feed themselves and is really getting a bad deal, they guess what they see on their handheld. They see people living in ways that they could only dream, and they want it because there's no way to get there except to violently try to grab. You understand that the people who are part of the Black Lives Matter 
platform is the destruction, the end of capitalism. Yep. They also talk about the end of the nuclear family, which I don't understand at all. But they're against the, the capitalist system because they right. feel it ultimately sort of does what you've been complaining about. And you like capitalism, you say, even yep. though even you, you, even Hank Scheinkoff, feels that it, it somehow disadvantages you. And how does it disadvantage you? You won't have enough money to give to your children. No, for, that's not For I'm many saying. of the I'm people in the street, gonna, that's no, no, just nonsense. No. Hold on. Go back. What I'm saying is the inter, if you are on the bottom, you can't transfer intergenerational wealth. And the end result is that more wealth is then concentrated at the top. Go back. You want to deal with it so we can all have peace and quiet or at least have the normal discourse that goes into American life and what happens in a democracy. We must have tension and chaos in order for it to survive. Where there is no noise, there is no democracy. You want to fix it? You know how you do it? You want to get rid of social movements that are destructive? You enact legislation and make them go away. The Townsend movement was the spur for Social Security. Pensions was the argument. Guess what? Goodbye, Townsend movement. You want to get rid of the civil rights movement, if that's what your desire is, pass the Civil Rights Acts of 64 and 65, okay? You want to get rid of uh, health care for all in the beginning, 50 years ago? You don't side with the AMA to stop, uh, to stop Medicare, but you pass it in 66. And by the way, you, don't, you undo Medicaid, which is an unfair second-tier system of providing medical care for people. You want to take care of problems, you pass the laws, you ameliorate the condition to some extent, even symbolically, and the social movements die. But if you don't pass the laws, the social movements have more power and they engage in more, more destructive behavior. Organized people, the social movement on the, on the West Coast was to organize uh, Mexican-American farm workers. Guess what? They got to unionize and the movement disappeared. And I can go on, 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 on. You end the Vietnam War, the Vietnam War movement is over. That's how you deal with the problem. You want to end movements, you enact legislation and you make changes. Because then the discussion becomes about that, not about violence in the streets. At the moment, there's very little discussion about legislation. In fact, what the young people are saying is, we don't care about all the legislation that's been passed to end racial inequality. Racism exists as, they're saying it's systemic. I don't believe it's systemic, and I agree with you. I don't believe America is racist. I don't believe America Jews are racist. But I do believe still, Hank, in America, it's better to be white than black. And that's a no social question. reality. Not, But the laws have been changed. All the laws that would make this. And, you know, good for America that over time, in our lifetime, in your lifetime and my lifetime, we have seen a dramatic shift in the law, which makes it sure. now illegal to be racist, to act in a racist fashion. That seems to mean nothing to the young people in the street. We don't change the tax system. We don't provide real change in that way. This is going to happen again. I keep saying it. This is now economic. Young people in the street have every right to be in the street if they choose to, but they have no right to destroy property or to hurt individuals. That's a different question. As to the statues, I want to respond to something you said before. What other country in the world has statues of traitors in its midst? What do I mean by that? The Southern generals and these other nincompoops revolted against the authority of the United States government. You make them into heroes? What system do they defend? Racism, inequality, and the abuse of other human beings. You make them into heroes? You put statues up? If I were black and I saw that, I'd lose my mind. If I lived in Richmond, I would lose my mind. Reason. I spoke. What's interesting is I specifically excluded any Confederate statue. I didn't talk about Robert E. Lee. I talked about Washington, Jefferson, Jackson, and yep. Theodore Roosevelt. Terrible. Terrible. They should leave those statues alone. I think it's outrageous to even begin to talk about George Washington among the great men of history. Why? He could have been a king. Instead, he chose to be a president. But he pretty owned a slave. Spectacular. He owned a slave is what the argument is. You know... <laughs> It's, a, it's an argument that I can understand, but there's some point we need to have a discussion about it and not engage in this kind of barbaric behavior in the streets. But wait, it's not an argument that I can understand. And I, hey, Look, I, people can I, talk the, about it. I'd rather that they talk than they act. I'd rather people talk about things so they can act appropriately. But wait, I cannot let the CNN issue pass. 
I must hear you. You were fired from CNN. Yeah, I was, I, was, I was a regular on the Lou Dobbs program. We spent a lot of time attacking Obama. The program was canceled, and I, my contract was not renewed. I assume they never said it that way to you, correct? No. They just, I showed up to work one night. It was a Thursday evening. It was great. Um, myself and the two other panelists, and um, we were told, uh, this is your last show. What's your sense in general about the way CNN has morphed many people many people find from what once was a news channel to a partisan advocacy channel we have partisan advocacy now as news all the time i mean we're looking for walter cronkite and i don't want to blow people's brains out but he's dead there is no there is no you know johnson when he when he realized the trouble he was in about the vietnam war said you know when cronkite went there and came back and did an essay on the air and said by the way this is wrong. Johnson said, well, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost America. The fact is, no one's going to look at any of the anchors on any of these outfits and say Fox, CNN, or MSNBC, and say, or even the, even the, the three broadcast networks, four broadcast networks. They're going to say, oh, by the way, I've lost any of those guys. I've lost America. No, because it is a reflection of where we are as a nation. We are now more balkanized, more confused, less united. We don't have any unifying arguments. We don't have a basic ethos that works. And I believe in my heart, and this is my, maybe it's, uh, I'm, I should really do some more research about it. My doctor research was about the Catholic Church, and I think I understand religion reasonably well as, an, as a motivating argument, as an organizing tool. But I, I look and I say, you know, God is, you know, if you get rid of God, you get rid of everything. And this great nation, based in religiosity, in God we trust, has decided to lose God as well. And that may be the reason why many of these things are happening. We don't have the unifying argument anymore. I'll say this again. Every time you speak, it raises at least 40 questions in my mind. So although we have to stop, you must promise me that I can call you again and we can just pick this up sometime in the very near future. It would be, I, would pay, I, would, I would be tremendously grateful if we did that. And I hope I haven't annoyed too many of your, your viewers and I hope they have a very good rest of the day. Hank, you're doing wonderful work, and you've been very, very kind to me, and I love you. I wish you kol tuva hatzlacha. You, and you, you should stay safe. You and your wife should stay safe and, stay, stay safe and healthy and, and come out of this coronavirus on the other side, and we will see each other when that happens. In the meantime, thank you always for the care and now for the time you've given to me here on JBS. I'm grateful to you. Thank you, my friend. The thoughts of one of America's leading political consultants, Hank Sheinkoff. I hope he's given you a sense of what Elliot Engel's defeat may mean for American Jewry and for the U.S.-Israeli relationship. My thanks, as always, to our director, Sloan Copeland, JBS's managing director, Dara Golub, transmission manager, John McDevitt, and to the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Stay safe and be well, my friends.